one. Good day, and welcome to our webinar on Edge, Fog, and Cloud, brought to you by CFE Media and Technology and sponsored by Epicor, Oracle NetSuite, and Wago. Today's presentation can provide continuing education credits. CFE Media has met the standards and requirements of the registered continuing education program. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to RECEP at RECEP.net. Today we'll be joined by Charles C. Byers, Associate Chief Technology Officer, Industrial Internet Consortium, by Ed Kuzemchek, CTO and Director of IoT, Software Design Solutions, and by Steve Hilton, Co-Founder and President, Mac Nation. I'm Kevin Parker, an editor with CFE Media. Thanks for tuning in to what's sure to be an interesting presentation and discussion. In the parlance of industrial automation, the edge has emerged as a term of considerable currency. The edge is found where the action is, at or near the industrial process. To relieve bandwidth constraints or inherent latencies and to improve system security and reliability, computational resources, ways to multi-purpose devices to computers are being stationed at the edge. These computational resources located at the edge can filter or process data so that only what's needed is transmitted to production control or enterprise systems and the cloud. In this webinar, we'll discuss how some of the options involved are evolving. Large volumes of streaming data can be processed and stored at the edge for domain control, human machine interface, supervisory control, and other. What's called fog processing takes place at the gateway level, where more processing power is available, but close enough to the equipment to support closed loop control. On the other hand, Manufacturing execution system applications, for example, may continue to rely on streaming data, but with analytic capabilities that extend across multiple machines and multiple levels of edge, fog, cloud hierarchy. Still other applications can be installed on a central server and used over a network with converged centers, sensors, and instruments and assets. What's sent to the cloud is for enterprise applications involving such things as big data, digital twins, or advanced analytics, that is, where data latency isn't a concern. Stay tuned to this webinar to learn about the kinds of computing resources, as well as the applicable standards and protocols, applications, and data management options relevant to edge, fog, and cloud. A certificate of completion will be available for each participant to don download upon successful completion of a test at the end of the presentation. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by RESEP. To take the learning unit exam, use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a separate browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, it will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on CFE Media websites with the on-demand version of this webcast. The exam is for one RECEP ASEC Certified Professional Development Hour. <clears throat> to get the best results from the webcast platform, please make note of the following as you participate in today's event. If you are having technical problems, click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to make before escalating to an online technician. If you are experiencing issues with your slides or audio, please refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's headshot. You can control the volume settings of this webcast by adjusting your computer's volume or the volume on the webcast platform. If you do need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Answers to your technical questions will also appear in the Answered Questions box on the left-hand side of the screen. The Ask a Question box is used to ask the speakers questions. You may ask at any time during the presentation. We'll get to as many as time allows. To download the presentation slides and certificate of completion, use the Event Resources box on the left-hand side of your screen. 
You can download the presentation and certificate of completion until the conclusion of the webcast. The link will break when the webcast signs off. This webcast is being recorded, including the Q&A session. We'll send you an email message within a link within a week with a direct link to the webcast archive. Now we'll hear from the sponsors of today's webinar. At the end of the video, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Stay tuned for today's presentation and discussion. The Wago PFC with cloud connectivity is easy to configure for your next IoT application. Compatible with all the big players like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, IBM's Bluemix, or your own hosted MQTT platform. The configuration is done using the controller's web-based management. Simply choose your cloud and type in your account's IoT endpoint details and you're all set. TLS encryption is supported on all platforms. With that entered, you can monitor the network status to verify your controller indeed connects. If you do lose connection, the controller has built-in buffering either to internal flash or an SD card up to 32 gigabytes, just by selecting the cache mode here. The controller is now ready to publish and subscribe your data using the easy-to-use eCockpit library function blocks. If you'd like more information on this feature, please see the WAGO application note in the link below. Thank you for joining us. For more information, visit us at www.wago.us and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Between all of our different product lines, we have close to a thousand items and, and several thousand kits. It was just too big to manage. We could not do it without the right technology partner, and it became NetSuite. Using NetSuite and having Suite Commerce allows us to manage multiple areas, multiple facets. It's connected to your ERP and to your website. To manage transactions, to search transactions, to really see what was going on in the business, you have just mass amounts of data at your fingertips. Epicor Software Corporation provides industry-specific business software designed around the needs of manufacturing, distribution, retail, and services organizations. More than 40 years of experience with their customers' unique business processes and operational requirements is built into every solution, in the cloud, hosted, or on-premises. Today, over 20,000 customers in 150 countries around the world rely on their expertise and solutions to improve performance and profitability. Epicor is driving growth for companies globally with solutions including Epicor Enterprise Resource Planning, Human Capital Management, Financial Management, Manufacturing Execution Systems, Supply Chain Management, Retail Software, Distribution Software, Lumber and Build Materials Software, and Automotive Aftermarket Software. Epicor products are working today on a global scale, delivering impressive benefits to companies just like yours. For more information, please visit epicor.com. Welcome back. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, Charles C. Byers. Charles is Associate Chief Technology Officer of the Industrial Internet Consortium, now incorporating OpenFog. He works on the architecture and implementation of edge fog computing systems, common platforms, media processing systems, and the Internet of Things. Previously, he was a principal engineer and platform architect with Cisco, and a Bell Labs Fellow at Alcatel-Lucent. During his three decades in the telecommunications networking industry, he made contributions in areas including voice switching, broadband access, converged networks, VOIP, and many others. Charles received his Bachelor of Science in Electrical and Computing Engineering and a Master's in Electrical Engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He holds more than 80 U.S. patents. Chuck, welcome to today's webinar, and please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, and appreciate everyone being here and giving a listen to these important topics. 
As you can see from the agenda slide, uh, I'm going to be talking for approximately 10 or 15 minutes uh, about some of the high-level aspects of edge and fog computing, a little bit of overview about the Industrial Internet of Things, IIoT, and then we'll talk about use cases, uh, uh, attributes, requirements, and architectures. This is uh, a very high-level overview of IoT networks. They start with sensors, actuators, and intelligent devices associated directly with the physical things, the IoT plant that we are trying to control. Above them are layers of edge and fog nodes that provide intermediate communications, computation, and storage capabilities in support of those sensors, actuators, and intelligent devices. Much of the topic of today's webinar is centered on how we implement those edge fog nodes, their requirements and advantages in IoT networks. Finally, nearly everything that touches a computer these days will ultimately touch the cloud. And the cloud is becoming an important aspect of IoT systems as their highest level of authority. And we'll discuss a little bit about the interactions up and down these hierarchical levels of computation, networking, and storage capabilities. Next, let's talk a little bit about the way data is transformed as it climbs through that hierarchy of computation capabilities. At the very bottom, we see raw data in and out of the sensors and actuators. And these are really nothing more than ones and zeros that have a very little intrinsic value in terms of understanding the system underlying them. However, as we go up and transform that data into information, we can start doing things like assembling graphs and looking for limits and understanding trends. That starts to give us a little bit more insight into what those sensors are reading and a little better control over what those actuators are influencing. Further up is the knowledge tier where those information insights are actually converted into things that might be even higher level. Things, for example, like um, we think that there's something abnormal about this system, or we think that, uh, that there may be difficulties with our suppliers. Those sorts of things could represent knowledge. Finally, the last level of distillation is to generate wisdom. That's where we can do business scenario planning based on the digestion of all of the data, information, and knowledge below. Wisdom is really what you get out of the cloud and what people who are paying for these IoT systems are expecting them to deliver. So wisdom is the ultimate goal, and all of those stages of transformation up that pyramid represent opportunities for edge and fog computing to add value. This is an example of an edge fog use case, and, and certainly we've identified use cases from 16 to 20 different vertical markets. Uh, the one that we're really talking about here is, is sort of a smart city use case. And what you'll notice is that there's a sort of cloud in the middle that's providing much of the, the high level control of this smart city, but the cloud can't do it all by itself. It needs layers of different kinds of nodes sprinkled around the city in order to aggregate all of the sensor readings, distribute all of the actuator commands, and provide levels of analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning processing, as well as distributed storage for all of that data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. The fog nodes and edge nodes, as shown here, are split into about three or four different hierarchical levels. We certainly have regional nodes that might be, you know, the whole north side of the city or something like that. And next we have uh, section level fog nodes, maybe Chinatown or, or the dockyards may have uh, a fog node supporting them. Uh, then we have uh, street level fog nodes, perhaps distributed in a fairly tight granularity around the city. Every few city blocks uh, in diameter, there may be a, a street level fog node. 
individual buildings among those street level fog nodes may have their own capabilities. And then uh, finally, there might even be individual nodes sprinkled around those buildings at the floor level or the wing level or the section level. All this hierarchy of processing together represents a mechanism to manage the fire hose of data that might be coming out of big sets of sensors and to distribute the various actuator commands required in IoT systems. These nodes also provide significant capabilities for management and security to, to make that data trustworthy as it traverses the network. There's a, a pendulum that's been swinging back and forth for over 40 years regarding centralized versus distributed computing. And, and uh, you might recognize uh, some of these technologies. Some of them might even be before your time. Uh, we started with slide rules and adding machines in everybody's desks, and then we went to centralized timeshare computers and back to distributed PCs and workstations. And then from there, we went to the internet and the web and the search capabilities. Uh, we swung back uh, perhaps sometime in the 1990s towards reliance on smart phones and tablets and other kinds of portable devices. Uh, most recently, the pendulum has swung pretty hard over to the right in terms of embracing cloud computing. And take a look at the hype cycle associated with that. Take a look at the amount of uh, revenue being made by Amazon and Google and Microsoft and other cloud service providers. Our assertion is that that pendulum is on its way back to the left again, where the cloud computing resources are being supplemented or in a few cases replaced by more distributed resources associated with edge and fog nodes spread around the IoT infrastructure on a fairly dispersed mode. Let's talk a little bit more about the need for doing this. Why wouldn't we run everything in the cloud if we could run everything in the cloud? Well, there's some reasons for that. So here we see the cloud can't really run everything because there might be problems with latency or the mobility of the endpoints might confuse the cloud, or various kinds of geographic focus. The network bandwidth could be very expensive to backhaul things like 4K video surveillance camera feeds streaming back to the cloud. Uh, there might be reliability problems if the cloud fails or is under a DDoS attack, for example, we may not be able to trust it. Uh, there are certainly security difficulties with centralizing all of our data in the cloud. It, it provides a, a mechanism for a single breach to do quite a lot of harm. And there might be privacy challenges associated with moving the data across various boundaries and into the cloud. So if we can't do everything in the cloud and we need to move it further in the network, what if we move it all the way down and make all of the endpoints intelligent? Well, it turns out there's problems with that too because we can't necessarily afford the energy and space required for high capacity, highly capable nodes with various kinds of processors down in all of those little devices. Those devices might be battery powered and those batteries might be expected to last a decade. It's hard to run a 100 watt graphics processor accelerator down there under that kind of power constraint. We also may have environmental constraints. Uh, those, those external devices might run full military temperature ranges, 40 below zero to 60 or 80 above centigrade, and, and that's potentially not a, a, a good environment for many kinds of systems. There might be reliability problems associated with uh, those small and expensive devices. Those devices may not be modular and expandable, and finally, there may be difficulty securing them, uh, not the least of which is the possibility of somebody taking a crowbar and yanking our security camera off the wall and taking it home with them. So we can't rely on doing everything in the endpoints. The solution that we're proposing here is to do things in these intermediate fog and edge nodes where the appropriate levels of processing, storage, and networking functionality is done at the right layer of the hierarchy of these networks. Sometimes there's only a single layer, like a simple edge gateway, or sometimes, as shown in that smart city example, there might be a half a dozen different layers between the endpoints and the bottom of the cloud. This we believe to be very advantageous for at least 40% of the data that will eventually be flowing through these IoT networks. 
And that's the focus of the rest of this webinar. This is an architectural breakout from the Industrial Internet Consortium, the organization that I represent. And it has some fairly interesting properties associated with it. It has three orthogonal systems, uh, three orthogonal representations of things that you could do to monitor and control that physical system down there on the bottom. There's a, a bunch of cross-cutting functions associated with things like connectivity and analytics and, and so on. They really apply to all portions of these architectures. Then there's uh, the system characteristics associated with trustworthiness that are shown on the top plane. And, and you can see several dimensions of trustworthiness. It's not just about security from hackers. It's about reliability and resilience and privacy and other things as well. And then finally, there's these functional domains. The design of our edge and fog systems need to take into account the basically control, sense, actuate, physical system feedback loops, but it also needs to take into account the, the business imperatives that these systems are trying to solve, the operational capabilities that these systems are trying to bring to place, the information models, how all this data is stored and abstracted and aged out and all the things associated with that, and then how an ecosystem of application software, especially application software that is written by the folks with the most domain expertise on the behavior of that physical system, how do they plug in? Is there, is there something equivalent to a software backplane? The Industrial Internet Consortium has a reference architecture, in fact, a series of reference architectures on different topics that can help answer some of those questions. Let me just give you a sample of one of those reference architectures. This is a particular reference architecture for fog computing that was done by the Open Fog Consortium before it was absorbed into IIC early this year. And what you'll notice here is a set of sort of hardware-related aspects of IoT networks in green. These are sort of the devices and their drivers. The dark blue segment represents a software platform. These are the, the intrinsic capabilities of fog nodes, and in many cases, edge nodes have similar capabilities in order to drive the, the basic functionality of the platform and provide the basic services that that platform provides. In uh, the light blue, we see some of the management capabilities of these systems, which are pervasive, and it turns out to be an important part of the total cost of ownership of these things is how they're managed. Finally, in you will see application support and application services. These are the layers that actually do the, the freight paying work that the, that the uh, providers of these networks are most interested in paying for, and, and that's where the, the software that will be uh, of, of greatest interest and probably most complexity would reside. So in conclusion, for my part of the talk, uh, the Industrial Internet of Things application space is growing rapidly. Sometimes processing solely at the edge or solely in the cloud is not quite enough. We need to have these intermediate layers of edge and fog computing in order to provide the functionality necessary and to meet the requirements associated with things like latency and security and network bandwidth. Uh, edge fog techniques are, we believe, valuable in nearly every IoT vertical and almost all IoT applications in some sense or other. And the Industrial Internet Consortium and the Open Fog Consortium's architectures point a way to design systems that, uh, that, that meet various interoperability requirements, various performance requirements, various security requirements, allowing us to assemble trustworthy industrial IoT systems. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I'll be around for questions later. And now I'd like to hand it off to Ed for part two. Well, let me know, this is Kevin. Thanks, Chuck, very much. Um, and before we turn to Ed, I have, one of our listeners has one simple, straightforward question to ask of you, and that is, are these edge fog architectures being actually used today in production environments? Uh, the answer to that is yes, absolutely. 
to some sense or other, the, these architectures are, are driving multiple edge and fog deployments. We've seen these architectures very useful in smart cities. We've seen them in oil and gas. We've seen them in agriculture and medical verticals. And uh, we've seen lots of suppliers of, of boxes and software and even open source software following these kinds of architectures. Great. Thanks, Matt. I'm sure we'll have more questions for you at the uh, uh, Q&A period. But let's turn now to our next speaker, Ed Kuzemchek. Ed is Chief Technology Officer, Director of IoT, and founder at Software Design Solutions. He's been creating embedded software solutions for nearly 30 years and was the president of Software Design Solutions for more than 13 years. The company provides embedded system software development, desktop application development, and software process improvement consulting. Ed, welcome to today's webinar, and please go ahead. Thank you, Kevin. I uh, want to take one of the uh, one of the major topics that Chuck talked about and take it one level deeper, and that is to talk about how compute at the fog and the edge uh, is is done, how you decide what to do where, and what kind of attributes and concerns and challenges come into play when you're making that decision. So let's begin by looking at the classic three-tier IoT application space where you have sensors on the device, just like uh, Chuck talked about, these are, these are interacting with the physical world. They generally report up to some kind of local gateway that is on property. Um, and then that gateway may report that data or quite often reports that data up to the cloud where Usually, people are thinking that's where they're going to get value out of their data. That's where they're going to do their big data analytics. That's where they're going to run their machine learning. And let's look at each of these layers with respect to a couple of different attributes. And uh, the first attribute we'll talk about is latency. Um, Chuck mentioned that latency is, is important and it's a concern with the cloud, and let's think about why. So if we have a sensor that's reading a temperature or a vibration or a rotational speed, if that information had to go all the way to the cloud and back to make any kind of decision on that information, that's probably too far. Um, that is why, you know, for the last 30 years, these, uh, these local fast loop control systems, your SCADA control systems, those kinds of things, weren't in the cloud, even if the cloud did exist back then, it, it, they wouldn't have been there. And that's because that fast loop control has to be done locally. And the main reason for that is latency. Uh, on the other hand, let's look at compute power. This is where our, our uh, benefit scale from red to green kind of turns on its head. The cloud, you can have as much compute power as you're willing to pay for. You need a thousand machines, you can have a thousand machines. You want to add GPUs to that and get yourself a thousand GPUs. But out on the out on the edge, there's lots of reasons why you can't have a lot of compute power. It might be that those systems need to run on batteries. It might be that those systems have to run in a noisy, dirty, wet environment, and you just can't find high performance systems that can run there cheaply. Uh, we'll talk in a, in, a, in a later slide here about the fact that the cost constraints of having lots of, of sensors out there really force you to have those sensors be reasonably inexpensive. Let's also talk about something that, that a lot of folks don't think about right away here, and that is context. In order to make a decision on a piece of data, it's often useful to have other data. And so if you have the individual sensor on your piece of machinery sensing maybe a pressure, it understands what pressure it's reading. And, and maybe you can keep a small amount of history about what pressures it's read over the last hour or the last day. But it probably doesn't know what's happening with vibration on that same machine. Or it probably doesn't know what's happening with current draw on the motor on that machine. And I'll make the claim that if it does, that's probably a poor design anyways. As that data from that one machine gets reported up to that local gateway, that local gateway now knows the pressure and the temperature and the current draw 
for that one machine or maybe for the three or four machines that that gateway is all about. So it has a little more context. It can make better decisions with that context. Now that, and that's exactly where your local fast loop control systems have typically run. Now, as that information gets sent up to the cloud, you have all of that data, plus you have historical data about how that machine behaved last week, last year. And perhaps you also have comparative data about how the same brand of machine uh, is, is performing in a different factory, in a different state or a different country. And now you can start to make a lot of interesting decisions based with that, on that additional context that you have. So very similar to latency is communication reliability. Obviously, the, the communication to the cloud and back is going to be the toughest, whereas the sensors themselves are often hardwired right into the local, the local compute. Finally, we've already talked about environmental. These sensors have a real tough life out there in, in terms of the environment that they need to live in, and that, is, and that makes it difficult. So what we see here with our green and red is we have this sweet spot right in the middle that I'll contend that, that up until now folks have not paid enough attention to, and that's this fog processing where folks are saying, oh, we'll do everything in the cloud, or maybe we'll do everything out on the edge. And I think that Chuck made a great point that uh, we need to start thinking about doing things halfway uh, down that list, which is at the fog. So let's talk about what kinds of things can we do. So first of all, we can move some of the compute that we would think about doing up at the cloud down to the fog. For example, machine learning. Once a machine learning model is trained, you can move that trained model and often a portion of that trained model down to run locally. These local gateways are often, I would, I would claim, are often running 5 to 10 percent loading because you have a, you know, a quad core ARM processor running you know, a gigahertz and a half and it's doing nothing more than receiving some serial data and packing it up in an MQTT message and sending it to the cloud. I mean, that's something that, that a fraction of that processor could do. Now you could take advantage of that, of that processor and take advantage of the fact that gateways are usually plugged into the wall so you don't have to worry about power. You could add a GPU if you like. You could do some local machine learning. That same GPU could be doing pattern matching, could be doing some interesting filtering or image processing. And you could do a lot of data reduction at that layer so that now you could be you could be doing your sampling in your in your uh in your sensors your sensors can remain fairly simple and sending their data to the local compute fog which then can reduce that data and then send up the interesting uh, the interesting answers i would claim that that uh, that can be provided up to the cloud now there's still a lot that has to stay at the cloud and that really comes down to that idea of context, compute power, and storage. So with the additional context, that's where you can do things like preventative maintenance. You know, if you're going to start to do preventative maintenance, you're going to want to look at a lot of different systems. And we're not going to want to be able to share everything about every system to every system. So let's move that and let's move those kinds of things up to the cloud. It's also where you do things like asset management and health monitoring and those kinds of things. And so there's still lots of room for the classical big data uh, analytics types of applications up at the cloud. But let's move some of the analysis and quick turn fast loop control uh, down at the fog. So specifically, let's talk about edge node challenges. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges about edge nodes comes from this triangle here, which is the number of them. You know, generally, I like to think of the cloud as one thing, even though it might be, you know, 100 computers up there. But it's really one concept in an IoT system. Uh, but down at the fog, now you're going to have tens to hundreds of gateways. But out at the edge, you're going to have thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of devices. So now 
if you have to add, say, two dollars, three dollars to a fog device, it's not a real big, you know, not a real big deal. But if you have to add two or three dollars to an edge device, now that turns into two hundred thousand or two million dollars, where the cost constraints on the edge devices are very significant. Uh, Chuck mentioned security. It's easier to update a piece of cloud software, quite hard to update all the way out at the edge. It's important to be able to do so uh, with over-the-air update, but it may be quite difficult to get it done the way you'd like to have it done. Uh, similarly, those edge devices generally are part of an existing fast loop control system. And that fast loop control system might be something that has already been there 15 years. These, these types of industrial systems have very long lifetimes. And to come in and say, oh, I can give you a really cool, fancy uh, IoT system if you just replace all these pumps and all these valves and all these meters in your, you know, in your refinery with these fancy new meters. You know, that, you, you, that would be a short meeting with a, with a customer. What you have to be able to do is retrofit existing systems, live in a multi-vendor compatible world where some of these systems are already providing data, maybe not data in the format you'd really like it to be, but the SCADA systems have had to have some of this data for a long time. So being able to uh, have compatibility with existing systems from multiple vendors is an important piece of an IoT system, particularly an industrial. And finally, we've, we've kind of, uh, you know, had a lot to say about environmental, but I think that the three big topics here are sensors live in a very harsh environment, usually. You know, in a, in a, a smart agriculture type of environment that is shown here, uh, you can think about, you know, the mud and the dirt and the water that you have to live in, the fact that you're almost almost always going to be battery powered. And finally, communication availability might be tough. Cellular, you think it's all you think it's everywhere. It might be it might be uh, pretty good in, in a lot of places, but you'll find a lot of places uh, in some of these domains like agriculture and uh, oil and gas where you get into areas where cellular just isn't there yet. So to summarize, um, you know, we've talked about edge nodes. They have unique challenges in industrial IoT and in IoT in general. You need to think about those challenges as you're doing your design. So if you, uh, to achieve the right level of computing at the fog, the edge, and the cloud, you want to take advantage of the edge's proximity to the data, but then split up the work that you would think about doing in the cloud to cloud and fog and even some edge com components. And you don't really need to reinvent the wheel here. You can take a reference architecture like OpenFog as a guide. I mean, there's a lot of good ideas there and a lot of good um, best practices to follow. So Kevin, that's all I have. Thank you everyone for your interest and I'll be around for questions. Great, Ed, thanks so much. Let's turn to our final speaker and panelist, Steve Hilton. Steve is a co-founder and president at Mac Nation, a firm dedicated to testing and researching IoT platforms, middleware, architectures, and services. Steve has 23 years experience in the technology sector. Prior to founding Mac Nation, he built and ran the IoT and enterprise practice areas at Analyst Mason. He has also held senior positions at Yankee Group, Lucent Technologies, Telephone and Data Systems, and Cambridge Strategic Management Group. Steve is a frequent speaker at industry and client events and publishes articles and blogs in respected trade journals. He holds a degree in economics from the University of Chicago and a master's degree in marketing from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. Steve, welcome to today's webinar, and please go ahead. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. So we heard from uh, Chuck and Ed today some great thoughts um, about edge and fog. And so maybe now you're convinced. Yes, in fact, I want to use edge and fog in uh, one or more of my deployments of IoT. 
And so you might be asking yourself, oh, okay, well, how do I either build an edge or fog platform or how do I find a good one um, that already exists on the market to use? And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, key enterprise requirements for edge and fog. Um, as Kevin said, MacNation, just to level set, we're a research firm focused on enterprise industrial IoT. We test, we have a test and benchmarking lab for IoT edge and cloud platforms. In essence, we touch all the microservices of edge and cloud platforms that exist on the market. We've used about 30 platforms, um, running a set of about 110 developer workflows on every platform. In essence, we pretend to be um, a platform user, right? And we go through a series of, of tests on each platform. It gives us really deep insights into these platforms. We're based in Boston. We're in our sixth year of business. So we've done all these kinds of tests. We've come up with some interesting findings. And I think the first one is, let me put this out as food for thought. Roughly 90% of the complexity at the edge and in the fog is software related. There's a lot of talk about, uh, especially from sort of vendors, um, who, who sell edge and fog um, solutions about sort of the hardware, but in actuality, it's the, the complexity is really around the software. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. When I talk about um, the three enterprise requirements at a high level for um, edge and fog platforms. Um, and I think I'll just uh, go down the list. Um, the first one is edge and fog data processing. So if you think about edge and fog data processing, what is that really all about? I mean, I think at a high level, that means let's do something meaningful with the data that we collect. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, these solutions that we put in uh, have to have some kind of business value. There has to be a reason that we're um, collecting and analyzing and making decisions and controlling off of data. So edge and fog data processing, these platforms, um, if you think about choosing an excellent platform that has edge and fog data capabilities. These platforms have to exhibit robust um, processing capabilities. We believe that an effective edge fog platform should have the ability to ingest data by offering broad and extensive support for southbound protocols. So southbound protocol support and various connectivity options, including legacy protocols such as Modbus, um, Profibus over RS-232 or RS-485 physical layers, as well as contemporary protocols such as Profinet over Ethernet. Secondly, um, these platforms need to um, support data normalization to enable uh, really the remote configuration and management of these normalization functions. So those would be things like the ability to apply statistical functions, to um, apply custom algorithms to data and custom data structures um, applied to raw ingested machine data. Um, thirdly, these platforms need to provide flexible data storage, storage that makes it easy to store the machine data at the edge for immediate or future use by edge applications. Fourth, the platforms need to provide an event processor or sometimes it's called a rules engine that can handle simple rules via declarative configuration. They also need to be able to handle complex rules um, where you might leverage like a scripting logic or some kind of custom code. And finally, um, an, an on-edge or cloud platform needs to have visualization capabilities uh, to allow, in essence, developers to quickly view single pieces of data, single data sets, single devices, or groups of data groups of devices. So that's the first enterprise requirement, edge and fog data processing. The second enterprise requirement to pick um, an excellent IoT um, edge or fog platform is really around edge and fog management. The idea that frankly, the platform and the solution should be easy to support. Um, and there are five sort of sub requirements here. Um, but overall, the, the, the best edge and fog platforms um, should have built the platforms with um, sort of a sophisticated management capability. And that kind of capability is demonstrated when the platform provides capabilities um, to do firstly remote configuration, to be able to update um, the remotely configured state of edge devices. Uh, and you need to be able to do that through a structured a programmatic approach like using an API, 
um, and or a declarative interface, so some kind of operator UI. Secondly, the platform should offer microservices that facilitate uh, remote software management. So they should be able to facilitate remote software management, deployment and monitoring of edge software packages. And these packages should include things like applications, platforms, and obviously the firmware itself. Thirdly, uh, the platform should enable connectivity management um, um, and really operational insight into whatever connectivity solution is required for a given implementation. Fourthly, the platform should provide a simple way to deploy software. Um, frankly, you know, there are different ways to do this, but probably having like a, a modern mm, infrastructure agnostic container technology, something like Docker, to allow uh, the reuse of components and the code, right, or to lower deployment costs and time and, and reduce sort of implementation time overall. And finally, uh, the platform should enable autonomy. And by autonomy, we really mean sort of the, the solution should be a, a bunch of self-contained nodes that are able to operate autonomously. And Chuck and Ed talked about this, right? So that the, the, the nodes can take action, store data, can queue commands to ensure that the overall reliability of the IOT process is never compromised. So that's the second enterprise requirement um, in picking an edge and cloud platform. It's around edge and fog management. Now the third enterprise requirement um, is a combination of things, but I, I think loosely we would bucket it into the concept of architecture and integration, which means that whatever you build for this platform or you go out to the market and find a platform that can provide this to you, it should be at a high level. It should be well built and it should be secure. Um, so that the best edge and fog technology sort of exhibits what I would describe as a cogent architecture um, with some really robust integration capabilities. So if you think about sort of the cogency of platform architecture, um, firstly, um, we look for an IoT edge platform um, that has uh, an excellent or a well-executed security model. So that means it can mean a lot of things, but it, it does involve providing both certificate-based and pre-shared key-based authentication of edge devices, end-to-end -end encryption, um, really of all management and data plane communication, also at, at rest encryption of on-platform data. And finally, it enables multi, uh, flexible multi-factor MFA, multi-factor um, authentication models for end users. That's really important um, from a security perspective. Secondly, um, the platform should be, I guess I describe it as, as productized or a productized uh, platform. And that means that it should be a cohesive product offering with a refined and well-presented UI. It should be cogent, sort of fully unified offering, not a bunch of sort of disparate pieces that have been uh, attempted to be put together, right? So it should be uh, sort of overall polished and refined product experience, sort of the UX should be polished and refined. And we can go into sort of UX and sort of the, the types of personas, types of users of platforms. It's a really interesting topic for another day as well. I think thirdly, the platform architecture and in integration, a platform should have a marketplace, right? An edge marketplace, um, and, which is really an app store-like technology platform. So this would enable developers to, um, to uh, distribute globally their edge software to enterprises, to system integrators, to any users of the platform. This makes uh, platform use just a lot easier. Um, and finally, um, the platform should um, provide flexible cloud and local integrations. And these should be either API based or use pre-built productized type connectors, right? To allow the flow of data to and from external systems um, systems like ERP or CRM SFA, inventory management, uh, trouble ticketing, or other kinds of um, enterprise applications. So those are the four, um, I'm sorry, those are the four sub requirements for this category, this third um, category of uh, enterprise architecture and integration for an IoT edge and cloud platform. So that's really what I wanted to cover today. You know, in conclusion, um, you know, enterprises are, are you know, engaging and building edge and cloud platforms and really need to look for these three things. And these, these three things are edge and fog data processing, 
edge and fog management, and architecture and integration. And once again, 90% of the complexity related to edge and fog comes from the software and these platform um, components that I just talked about. Thank you, and I, I'll turn things back now to uh, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, Steve, is it safe to assume that when it comes to the products that you're testing in your lab, there's kind of a bell curve in terms of to what extent each, all of the different uh, products or systems would do in terms of the requirements that you just laid out for us? Uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say that it's sort of a bell curve with a very long tail, though. <laughs> so maybe it's not exactly a bell curve. Maybe it's very skewed. So what I would say is there's no perfect platform on the market for, for edge and fog, right? So at the end of the day, each platform has its strong microservices and its weak microservices. So when the trick, of course, is to define your IoT solution architecture up front and know exactly what you need, link that, that solution architecture to sort of the strengths and weaknesses of these various platforms. Thanks, Steve. And we've got a question here. I didn't think any of our panel members would be interested in engaging with it, but it turns out they, they are very interested in uh, engaging with it. So I'll just read it. It says, what is the possibility of utilizing the sinoatrial node found in the human body that creates the body's electricity for tie-in in in the IoT network. And Ed, I think you were one of the panel members that was interested in addressing that. Please go ahead. Uh, Thank you, Kevin. Uh, So when we talk about these edge nodes, and uh, one of the things we mentioned is power is a real concern here, and there's a lot of interest in doing energy harvesting in some manner to, uh, to keep these edge nodes powered. So on a wearable device, like the many, many different wellness devices that people are starting to wear on their body, um, there's a lot of opportunity to take things like motion or even temperature from the skin and turn that into little bits of electricity that can over time be integrated into enough power to charge up a battery or charge up a a, a supercapacitor or something. Now this question is a very interesting one because that's not a lot of electricity and you really don't want to be messing with it much because it powers your heart. But it is, there is opportunity there because it is energy that the body creates. And so I think that, you know, if we're talking, you know, Star Trek kind of time frames here, the, those kinds of things where the where energy that the body's creating in some form, be it motion, heat, or this sinoatrial uh, energy that it, that the body creates, may become an opportunity for energy harvesting. Really interesting. Chuck, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just in terms of of bioelectrical interfaces to the human body, uh, they already exist. The implantable pacemaker defibrillator devices interact directly with the SA node, both sensing and actuating. So they're they're listening to the electrical signals created by the heart, determining if they're normal or not. And if it detects something abnormal, it discharges a bunch of energy to shock the heart back into correct rhythm by, by playing that energy into the SA node and associated tissues. Uh, we've seen many opportunities to use the electrical signals in the body. Uh, myoelectric prosthetics for amputees are an excellent example. Sensors on, uh, on the vestigial uh, stump of the arm or leg and a bunch of processing, which could be considered an, an edge or fog node as part of the prosthetic and then a bunch of actuators to try to replace the functions of the missing limbs. Uh, That technology has existed for 20 or 30 years, but it has taken off uh, with sophistication and ease of use improvements drastically happening in the last five years or so as a direct result of using IoT and low-cost computation techniques. Really interesting. Um, Chuck, another question for you. I mean, I know that the whole topic of this webinar has been distinctions between edge fog and cloud, but that distinction between edge and fog is kind of difficult to to to, to grasp. I, I wonder if you take a, uh, a, a shot at it, and then 
you know, maybe Ed will have a slightly different approach and Steve might have a slightly different approach to just characterize the difference between edge and fog. Sure. As the Open Fog Consortium was combined with the Industrial Internet Consortium, which had a large edge computing task group, we had to ask ourselves this very question. And the chief technology officers of IAC decided that uh, that there are some subtle differences between edge and fog uh, and a lot of similarities. So, so some of the similarities are they're both very concerned about security and manageability and using elastic compute resources in the cloud. They tend to be highly distributed deployments. Some have public versus private aspects to them. Uh, and they have quite a lot of scalability uh, up and down various spectra. Uh, some of the subtle differences between edge and fog, fog tends to be somewhat more hierarchical. Edge is often talked about in terms of a, a layer of gateways at the very bottom of the network just before the IoT devices. Uh, it, fog tends to be a little bit more multi-domain, so fog nodes are, are kind of set up to serve multiple tenants and multiple vertical applications, where edge nodes are quite often owned by a single entity with a single mission with a single set of sensors underneath it that they're responsible for. Uh, fog also tends to put somewhat more emphasis on what are sometimes called east-west flows. So all of these systems have what we call north-south flows, meaning that data flows in the direction from the cloud down to the uh, edge points through the, through the edge and fog nodes and into the IoT endpoints, and then back up through that north-south hierarchy. But also, uh, fog nodes in particular talk to their peers and on diagonal paths. So, so adjacent uh, block-level fog nodes in smart cities, for example, have, have east-west connectivity to enable them to share loads and do fault tolerance and other things. The bottom line from IIC is we decided that the similarities are much more important than the differences. Things are 95% the same. And going forward, IIC is going to move towards calling the conjunction of both technologies edge, just to simplify things. So you'll hear a lot more about edge and the term fog may end up getting a, a little more esoteric as, as time goes on. Thanks. Good. Any further thoughts from the panel on that topic? Uh, Chuck, this is Ed. I, I, I just want to say that, that uh, I mean, I agree uh, with, with, uh, with you, Chuck, on that, and I think specifically the part about north-south versus east-west. Uh, to me, that is where the the differentiation kind of comes in. That to me, an edge node has a purpose, has a singular purpose, and is and I used to think it was a singular sensor, but I've you know evolved, I guess, in that uh, in 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 that opinion. Um, and I think that uh, sometimes things move. Uh, five years ago, I would have called a LiDAR system a fog system. And these days, I can go out and buy one off the shelf and plug it in, and it just works like a sensor. And so, may, and, and that certainly makes that an edge device to me. And so I think that, that uh, I'll be okay if we end up calling everything edge. I'll kind of miss the word fog, but uh, I, I'll update my slides. Yeah, me too. And, and uh, fog will, will persist as uh, certainly branding of companies like, like Cisco was very interested in fog for quite a while. Uh, and, and as a, a subtle differentiation of very capable edge nodes, they may still uh, occasionally be called this. This is a foggy capability because it's it's edge plus plus. But but for now we're yeah. we're encouraging driving towards edge. And there's like four times as many Google hits if you search for edge computing versus fog computing. So that's kind of where the market seems to be heading in terms of its uh, vocabulary preferences. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, Steve, the final question is for you. Talk a little bit about the applications in the industrial space to which edge, fog, and cloud are being put. I mean, I, in, in certainly uh, predictive maintenance, uh, process optimization, but especially to what extent are you finding in your testing whether the data that's gathered um, through the, 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 the sensing at the, at the lowest level is, is, can be used uh, immediately for analytics or machine learning or even art artificial intelligence. Uh, are you delving into those areas as well? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So I was just on the phone this morning um, with um, VP of architecture at a large 
multi-billion euro um, company in Germany that builds um, medical and healthcare equipment. And they are thinking about, you know, the building of these solutions to support a whole variety of applications on the factory floor. And you've named almost all of them, you know, machine learning, um, sort of factory automation type solutions, and just even just frankly, simple, can I get the data off of an old PLC? You know, like just even really easy stuff. Um, you know, and then how do I manage the devices and things like that? So I think from, from the sort of actual user's perspective, the architectures are great. The applications are great. The challenge is almost always we're not deploying in a greenfield environment. There's all kinds of existing technology. There's legacy technology in place and requirements to use old stuff, right? And just because we've come around now and we're talking about edge doesn't mean the enterprise is going to rip out everything that's already in the ground and replace it with, a, you know, because we have a new architecture. So I think sort of the devil is in the details, in the creation and the support of a lot of these applications. Um, with edge and fog and requires, you know, careful testing, careful analysis um, of sort of the KPIs and metrics that you need, candled against sort of what you already have and constraints you might have from a technology perspective. Great. Thanks so much. We'll get answers from the rest of our panel members to that issue and some others and post it with the archived version of this webinar if you're interested in because unfortunately that's all the questions we have time for today. Uh, thanks to our expert panelists, and they really were experts, and thank you all for attending to today's webcast. We hope it suited your purposes. For more information, go to the website link noted in the interface or visit us at IIoT for Engineers at CFE Media. I'd like to thank our sponsors for today's webcast, and now that we're just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it as we use this information to improve our webcast. On behalf of CFE Media and Technology, we'll see you next time.